to start the recording. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So we're very happy that we have one hour and can hopefully give you an interesting overview about PDF A3 as a preservation format. Unfortunately, we cannot be in Finland today, but hope you can hear us. You can see the screen and we'll get some interesting information because this is a little bit anonymous. I want at least to show you the pictures of the speakers. So Achim Hübner, who will talk to together with me or after me, is can you can be you can see at least a picture from him here. Later you will hear him. And we can also have a nice short picture from me. So in order to so that's me and long time ago, so <laughs> still use uh, picture. So what we want to present you in well, up approximately one hour, so I will try to make it in 30 minutes, also Achim, and then we understand we have some time for questions and answers, what well, we are looking forward, is to talk about PDFA and PDFA3 as a preservation format. And before I start this presentation, I like to show you a very practical example, which is basically here. So what we will, you will see in the next hour is PDFA files. So it's opened in Adobe Reader. You say here in the top, sorry, it's German, but you get the idea or you know it from other PDFA files. It mentions it's a PDFA file. And as we are talking about PDFA3, we obviously did a PDFA3 file. So it's a very practical example here. So when I go to full screen, we will look to the PDFA view of this document or presentation. But here on the left, so when you use Adobe Reader, it's this clip, you see the embedded files. So this is the one main feature of PDFA3 that you can embed any files. I will come back to those examples later. <clears throat> but obviously I did this original presentation in PowerPoint. So PowerPoint is my source, but I converted it to a long-term safe PDFA3 file, but the source is embedded. So on the one hand, I have a document, an object, which contains a long-term format of the presentation. But if for whatever reasons I want to copy something or generate an, another presentation, I can easily access the PowerPoint source file and create another presentation. And as you see, I have embedded other files, which we will see later. So now we can go to full screen mode in order to start the presentation. First, I want to give you a short overview about the PDF Association, where the Finnish Business Archives and PDF Association are cooperation partners since, I don't know, two, three years. So we did a common seminar back in Helsinki some years ago, which was also very interesting. So the PDF Association is an association which, as the name indicates, look for PDF standards, so all the ISO worldwide PDF standards and obviously the topic or focus of today is PDFA for archiving. We have competency centers for each of the PDF standards. So also later, you're always welcome to contact the association if you have any questions about the usage or very deep technical questions. So just to give you an idea, so PDF standards, which are now belong by ISO, so it's not Adobe anymore. It was obviously when PDF was invented, but now PDF 2.0, this is a PDF version where the ISO currently works on. It's not published and published ISO standard yet. Then PDFA archiving, there's PDF UA for accessibility, not the topic of today, and also others you likely have heard of, PDFX, which is very common and famous in the pre-press industry, VT, is a little bit special for high volume printing and E is for engineering. The association has 150 members worldwide, so it's an international association. And those are the three major working areas where you are always welcome to contact us if you need any further information after <clears throat> today. So on the one hand, obviously we work on the technology. So we take part in the ISO standard committees working on all these standards, developing new versions, new standards, and we can provide technical information. So this is very up to very deep technical to bits and bytes if somebody of you needs that. Obviously, we do events. So like this webinar today, our major events are the PDF days in Europe. And just or now in October, we will have the PDF technical conference in the United States. And we go for exhibitions. So 
I guess you have heard about the ISMT archiving. So this is one example from this archiving and library community where I understand Finnish business archives also belongs to. So this is where we're also informed about the PDF standards. And then obviously we have our website, pdfa.org, which gives technical questions or a lot of information, articles, white papers, things like that. <clears throat> When we look to PDFA, then I just wanted to give you a little bit uh, the history uh, to give an intro introduction. So the whole thing was started back in 2001, where simply initiated by the US Kurds, but also from a lot of other industry, there was simply the need to have something which is long-term safe in this digital world. So obviously we all know paper has been around for 100 years, then we all know the IT moved on quite fast. And then back in 2001, there was a need from the US Kurds, but I also like to use the example of Airbus. So in airplane construction, you need or you must preserve the documents, the construction plans, things like that for 99 years. And also Airbus on its own said, oops, for digital documents, this is a very, very long time because IT is changing so fast. And then they also, Airbus sat down and said, hey, what can we do about that? And they had similar ideas like the ISO. They said, okay, let's look around. TIFF, very old format, JPEG, more for pictures than for documents. PDF is a good and modern format, but for the goal of long-term archiving, it can do too much. And that's where also Airbus, but also the ISO then had the same idea to say, okay, let us create a subset where the PDF features can be used, which are really long-term archiving guarantee. And then the standardization started and a lot of companies were in there and there was a first meeting in 2002. And then for ISO and standardization, this was quite fast, which also showed the need for a long-term archiving standard. So back in 2005, the first part of PDFA was published as an ISO standard and ISO also said at this point, obviously, this is a long-term archiving standard. This will never become invalid. So there's also an exception for ISO. So other standards are checked every 10 years, whether they are still valid or not. But on the other hand, ISO also could foresee the world moves on. There may be things which become interesting, and this is where ISO uses those parts. And this is where the overall standard is called PDFA, A for archiving. And then with a dash one, dash two, dash three, you see the parts, which yes, has some features. So in 2011, the PDFA dash two part was released where not too much features. So only the safe things for long-term archiving were added on the one hand, but in between Adobe moved PDF itself to ISO. So PDFA two really sits on top of PDF ISO standard and has a, yeah, a handful of features which are useful but not dangerous for long-term archiving. And then a little bit faster in 2012, PDFA 3 was released and this is obviously one of the major topics of our presentation today. Just one slide, I'm sure you have heard already about PDFA, but just to recap the base idea. So the goal was to have something in the digital world, which is safe for documents or for two dimensional documents for which allows for long term archiving and long means think of 99 years of industries. If you talk to insurances, they typically keep records for 80 years. When I speak to banks, they have 50 years. There are also documents which are more short term. But if we move obviously to the archive and library community, then long term means forever because they really have the goal and the mission to keep documents, valuable historic documents forever. And the principles are quite simple. Obviously, this maps to some technical details and checks, but I think uh, you can get a good idea of the cornerstones or symbols. So a lot of them came already with PDF. So it's device independent software version. So this was a requirement. 
you know you can have a PDF file on an iPhone, on a smartphone, on a tablet, on a normal PC. You can also have it software independent on Macintosh, on Windows, on Linux, <coughs> whatever operating system is used. So this is where already PDF had a lot of things and this is helps for PDFA because we all don't know whether we still will use a Windows laptop in 10 or 20 years from now. Then we have some major principle of self-containing. So this is that PDFA document must contain everything which is needed for future reproduction in an unknown environment. So this, this is one point. So everything is in and you can think of color spaces, color descriptions. So the red of our PDF association should be always the same red. And a very simple thing to remind is an easy thing like fonts, like Arial or Times New Roman. Obviously, when I use this Windows laptop here, this is installed on the system, but that's not safe forever and therefore it must be embedded. Then this is more feature. Achim will talk more about that, but PDFA also allows for metadata. So besides the document, besides the document image, you have very good options to <coughs> yes, use metadata embedded in the file and have a description, a metadata description about the document. And it's also transparent. So this is something for the worst case, but in 20 years, maybe Adobe is not around anymore. Microsoft is not around anymore. There should be still a civilized world with computers and the ISO, but then everybody, or at least the programmer, can sit down and write a PDF viewer because it's a very clear <coughs> description and specification. And very simple, and this is the goal, is to have something like the, <coughs> we all have known from paper, so something which is really safe digital paper for long-term archiving. And this goes for all application areas, so this is what we like to call the world picture, which was already developed 10 years ago, but that's the base idea. So very roughly it describes the different application areas. So when you have on the one hand, you start with a piece of paper. So in digitization projects where you do folder digitization or where you do digital mailroom applications, then obviously paper can be scanned and converted to PDFA. If you are within the organization or within the government agency, then there are a lot of internal documents which can be converted to PDFA. And the host is here a replacement or a placeholder for output documents. So just think of banks or your insurance. They send you still a lot of paper and obviously they archive this. And <laughs> here the incoming things, which is mainly email these days, they can be also converted to PDFA and we will see a few samples on that. <clears throat> and then one point I don't want to miss here is the validator thing. So because there is a standard, then there's also software and tools which can validate. So a document can say I am a PDFA, but you can check it and you can really validate whether all the technical details which a PDFA file must fulfill are really <coughs> given in this technical file. So this gives also an extended check and the quality of the archive and the archive document can be increased. So at the end, all application areas can become a PDFA file if needed. PDFA has also the option of embedded signatures. So that's also very easy to do. And then on the other side, obviously you have a defined and clear reproduction of the document. You can exchange it or you can also print it quite easily. Yeah, PDFA is around for 10 years. So there are also some best practices which I would like to share with you. So on the one hand, and we like to differentiate it basically into two worlds. So the one world starts with a piece of paper. I call it input. So every that's which is typically the input. So you get it in a digital mailroom or you have a digitization project. <laughs> where you scan a million pages, I was just in, a, <laughs> in another event, so it was construction folders of the government. So this is something which is a lot of paper around in the cellar. And this, a lot of at least German government agencies are digitizing this these days. And then <clears throat> obviously PDFA is a good format. And why is that? So the main benefits are obviously PDFA allows for full text searchability. So when you just scan a piece of paper, then you have a very dumb pixel image. 
let's put it this way. And with OCR, it's really full text. And this one in this area, application area, one of the major benefits. Color scanning, so there are compression schemes which allow for those things. You can have high compression and you have a safe long-term digital paper. When we go to what we call the born digital world, so this is a document which is already digital from the beginning, then <clears throat> obviously Office documents, so Office can be everything, Microsoft Office, Open Office, LibreOffice can be converted. I have another slide on that. PDF itself can be converted to PDFA, so this is a the good thing with PDF is you have thousand vendors and tools out there. The bad news is some of them are not producing technically good PDF and a typically PDF viewer will not show this to you. And this is where PDF A really helps for high quality archiving. So if there are any technical issues which may disturb in the future, then this will be immediately recognized. Email conversion. that. Emails can be converted and also forms can be worked on. This is a small side point, but also in the output area, think of banks or insurances. This can be, <coughs> excuse me, also, also converted. So for the scan, just to give you a short introduction, what can be done here. So if you really start with a piece of paper, then J PDFA allows for high compression, so this is maybe hopefully a nice example. So if you scan, Achim will come back to this. Today you can scan with 300 dpi full color, but if you have totally uncompressed TIFF, then even one page, normal page, is around 25 megabytes. That's no fun in your archive, much too much data, <coughs> slow in the network, things like that. So black and white was a choice of the past in history. Was a practical thing and if color was needed then it was JPEG but obviously there's a little bit marketing here but JPEG was never invented as a document so when we use our digital camera JPEG is wonderful and we all take pictures from our vacation but for documents it's simply not not the way to go and was never invented for that so nothing to blame with JPEG so this is not very nice and you can see it's not readable and if you think like OCR software then it really fails and also not to blame those formats are more than 20 years old so they're really old and not up to date anymore 20 years back this was okay hardware was slow memory was an issue but nowadays more modern things and here you can see the pdfa examples when you use some some tools for that you can really reach the size and that's simply to remind <coughs> which are the size you know from black and white for one page but you have full color in a very good quality. For the born digital world, I have some yeah, ideas I want to share with you, which are basically along around the workflow and the process. So the one thing I want to emphasize, obviously PDFA is not there to replace Office programs. That's not the idea. So <clears throat> Office has its use, is useful. So Let's take Osmo, for example, as long as I work on an article with Osmo, Word is wonderful. I write the first draft, Osmo gives some corrections, and we go back and forth until we have the final version of this document. But then it's a good point in time to say, okay, this is a version of this article about archiving, for example, and then it's a good point in the workflow to create a PDFA file, and Osmo and I can put it into our archive. So this is a <coughs> one thing that for PDFA conversion, please always think when is a good point in time. The same is true for or similar for forms. So there are a lot of PDF forms, which has good functionality around. So, but first it's a normal PDF and it has interactive fields. So obviously or a simple example, maybe there's a date of September 30th of today, which is okay. Tomorrow it will go to October 1st. But if I am, for example, the citizen who's completing a government form, then it's a good point in time because the completed form, this is, I did it today, so it's September 30th, and it should not jump to October 1st tomorrow. So this is also a good use case and the workflow aspects. For emails, there's a longer discussion, which we cannot do today, but there are the ideas to really 
do an early conversion when the email comes in or some users do a late conversion so when the emails when the process when the business process is done and then before it goes into the archive then it's for the sense of email archiving validation i mentioned this already <clears throat> so this is where you want to check this and here we have also some i would call it best practices and also something you can take away so if you want to check a sim sim single file so i sent this presentation to osmo and he or you wants to check it afterwards then you can just use a full version of acrobat and there's a function which is called preflight this will do on a single file basis to check <coughs> and if you but if you have to maybe if you're really working in an archive then and maybe you get documents from the government which are already pdfa then obviously you may want to check each incoming document whether it's really compliant to the standard before you put it in the archive and then also for migration there's some best practice so as much as i love pdfa <coughs> we do not recommend to just do it so maybe you have five million tiff files in your archive and uh, even if you're hopefully excited about PDFA tomorrow, you likely will not start this project. But this was also the best practice. So if for whatever reasons a migration is necessary, so the hardware may change, maybe the archiving system is changed and you, I call it, you touch every document anyway, then it's a pretty good idea to think about that. And very often we have seen that users are doing that. Then we have the PDFA3, so it's identical to PDFA. For technical people, it's quite boring because it's only one new feature, but this allows for a lot of new use cases. And the feature which was added or opened is that what PDF could do for a long time already, but in different ways, you can embed any file, and this is what opens a lot of new use cases. And the only thing you have to do, and this is what, what shows the good use cases of that, is you have to specify what is the type of the embedded file. And there are the types which are in bold here, which are described in the standards. So the one thing is source. I showed you the one. I did this presentation in PowerPoint. So this is a source. And now I have embedded it into the PDFA file. It's an alternate. I have a sample of electronic invoices in Germany, supplement, so this is any data which belongs to that, and those are the types you have to define, and there are other things, and we have some yes, best practices here already. So the one thing is really, especially in Germany, but I hear, see this in a lot of EU countries, honestly, I'm not aware what the status in Finland is, but typically Scandinavia is even more advanced than Germany. So the one thing is to have electronic invoices, and this is what is in Germany called Zuckford, which is very, very hot topic, and I can show you the short example here. So the idea is really to have, here's a sample. So this on the, you can see, this is a PDFA3 file again, this one looks like an invoice, even if you it's German again, sorry for that. This is okay for having an image, having something which a human being can very easily read. But for the electronic processing of invoices, there's an XML file embedded. So this allows for machine readable processing of the invoice. So if a user who, for example, runs SAP as an ERP system receives this invoice, he doesn't really care for the image. He takes the XML file, converts it to the SAP system, so the whole payment checking of the invoice is done on the machine and very few or nothing to do manually. But when it goes to the archive, it's again one nice archive object. So whenever it's needed, then in archive, long-term archiving or in archive, it's more interesting to look in the image. And the XML file is normally done when the invoice is paid and no further things. And this is true for all the cases so that you can really, and this was the idea, to use it as a preservation format to have this. The same is true for emails, for example. So here you can see that was an email and 
everything, including the attachment. So fax.doc was obviously an attachment, a doc file, and somewhere should be something like a, this looks like a PowerPoint presentation here. <clears throat> and also this one, the email and its attachments are converted to PDFA and the original EML file is embedded. So this is one usage of PDFA3. There's another option where you can also say, which gives you a lot of flexibility. I just want the body as PDFA file and I want to embed the attachments in the original format. You can see it's a doc, an Excel and a PowerPoint again. So this is a lot of flexibility which you can get here. So here's the example again on a screenshot, but I showed you the RIF thing. So you have the invoice and you have the <coughs> Suckford input file. And the same is true with the emails. So this also works obviously in other PDF viewers. So those, well, at least the modern PDF viewers can all handle PDF A3 files. So the emails can be, as I showed you, <coughs> embedded and you can have the full email or just the body as a PDFA file. So there are some use or different options and variants which you can use on that. Gives a lot of flexibility and uh, very good for archiving. Okay, and this is then already my summary, but my half hour is, <laughs> half hour is soon over. So there's also some criti criticism on this. So well, the one discussion in Germany was, is PDFA3 a cuckoo's egg? Well, I hope you get this idea. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I have a similar term in English. And there's some opinions, but also some best practices. And I guess also Achim will come back to that. So my, and it's my personal point of view, it's really, I think PDFA3 is a perfect solution for classic documents. So what all we use as documents, so if we talk about social media and WhatsApp messages, nobody really to, today knows how to archive this if it really gets into a business context. But for what we all use as documents, I really think PDFA3 is a perfect solution there's also this also the, the state of the discussion in the ISO. So there's not that they are heavily working on a PDF A-4 or whatever the name will be. So for the goal to have a safe and long-term flexible format, PDF A3 is now very mature, a state of the art. There may be some changes, but more on a <coughs> uh, yeah, theoretical level. But there are some critical voices because and this is obviously I showed you the good case, the good use cases. But with PDF A3, nobody prevents you to embed a virus or other bad software. So PDF A3 does not care. So the feature, as I showed you, is just you can embed any file. It can be a virus. <coughs> and it's um, nothing checking. So you just have to define the type. Or it can also contain a video. And this is also important. The long-term safe part is only what I showed you. I always like to call it the right side. So what we see as PDF A file, whether this PowerPoint works in 10 or 20 years from now, nobody knows. And also typically when I spoke to German state archives, they don't guarantee it. But it may be quite useful from the, from the use case. So the video does not get long-term safe. The document is. But think of a... a Instruction thing for a complex machine, it may be good to have the manual with 100 pages, but it may be a very good use case to say, okay, we have the video here, which just shows it how to use or to <clears throat> to maintain this machine. So this is the option, and but we openly wanted to present this. And we had some discussions, and this is a recommendation from the PDF Association, where if you think this is all bad, this is not good with PDF A3, then purists, I call them purists, they can stay with PDFA1 or 2 because ISO still maintains those standards. They will never become invalid. And we have some use users which said, OK, we are fine with PDFA part 1 and we will stay with that. And that's totally OK. And when you see good use cases, good application areas for PDFA3, then you can deploy it and benefit from the options I tried to show you. 
Okay, this was my part. Now I think I will hand over uh, to Achim. Oh, we have to just a short switch here. I can briefly check. Are there any direct questions, Osmar, or shall we move on? Uh, I just need to ask, haluaako joku vielä heti tehdä kysymyksiä? Vai odotetaanko to, toinen vaihe vielä? So, uh, maybe we are waiting uh, until the end of the presentation and then okay, other yeah. questions. Then we can have a discussion. I will hand over to Hans Joachim Hymna now. So, my name is Hans Joachim Hymner, called Achim. <laughs> a very warm hello to everybody over there in Finland. It's a pity that we could not travel, uh, but I hope it will work in this way for you in a good way. Um, and I wanted, want to share some um, experiences and um, best practice we have in uh, German and Switzerland uh, library and archives. <clears throat> um, as an overview, uh, what I will talk about, uh, it's a current approach to re retrospective digitization in libraries and archives. Um, um, of course, they are scanning, they define file formats, they use some uh, special compression. There's some color management necessary. Uh, I will um, show you the, um, uh, the, the mandatory of uh, um, if you uh, use that with PDFA. Um, um, there is some content to work on. Uh, you, will, you want to have a structure when you present it in the internet or every, uh, um, in any case in your library or your archival um, reading room. Uh, we have some technical metadata uh, to include. Um, and there is a necessity to um, present and exchange data within the uh, scientific um, community. Um, and then I will show the normal or the a very broad used uh, approach to uh, organize long time preservation and will uh, have a look on um, the alternative uh, what could be different with PDFA. Uh, some samples um, Thomas already showed to you, um, and I will show now some samples at the end uh, of some um, um, cultural institutions in Germany and Switzerland. Uh, a long time ago, the German uh, Research Association recommended um, how um, cultural heritage has to be scanned, uh, has to be digitized. They recommended 600 deep, some, some uh, resolutions at less to use, 600 dpi for black and white and 300 dpi for grayscale and color. Of course, we have special applications. Um, we have a sample, the Beethoven House in Bonn. Uh, we digitized um, in, the, in the way that we use the maximal uh, possible uh, resolution with a certain kind of camera, the cruiser camera, uh, because they want to have as much as information stored and uh, saved uh, in the images as possible. <clears throat> um, for the uh, several versions of the um, uh, images you will do you, have, do you, do you digitize, you usually have a digital master with the um, w which is not or lossless compressed. You will have the copies for daily use and print out uh, with less uh, um, um, resolution. And you ha have to, if you have a web presentation of your collections, um, you uh, have der derivates for presentation on the website. Uh, with possible different resolution versions or a Zoom server. 
when um, the users want to have an overview or uh, want to have uh, a detailed view on the also on the uh, website. The file formats and compression, which are normally used, still TIFF uncompressed for grayscale and color, um, TIFF LZW compressed, the patent protection expired in June uh, 2003. Um, we it's also um, a, a good thing to use JPEG 2000 lossless for mixed black and white in color and grayscale. Um, and uh, TIFF Fax Group 4 for black and white is still very, very common. Uh, for the derived images, also TIFF Fax Group 4, JPEG, JPEG 2000, and of course PDF, especially if you want to deliver documents from your website to the users. Color management is a very um, um, useful um, uh, um, feature, <coughs> which is mandatory in PDFA. Uh, if there's no color management in it or no uh, ICC profile, then every belly data for PDFA will say this is, um, this is an error. Uh, this is not really PDFA. And of course, it is useful to have uh, uh, the right uh, colors on every device you will print out or show or and so on. Um, you will gather a lot of meta metadata or you, you will want to, to present also to your users, of course, metadata. Um, the bibliographic metadata, the descriptive metadata from your library system or archival uh, archiving system. Um, you will gather structural metadata. Uh, I will show um, a sample a little bit later for what you can use it on the web presentation, for example. Um, so you will um, index chapter, subchapter, reg regions of interest for figures. Um, and you can uh, also apply attributes uh, to the structure elements. That means a chapter has a title or a label and so on. Uh, you can add content. Um, Thomas mentioned it already. Um, a lot of um, uh, digitized works in this area will be OCR'd. Um, from the structural metadata, it is possible to uh, uh, um, um, to make a table of content um, accessible, and this let you um, uh, uh, have access to a direct access to parts of the work you have digitized. And of course, um, you, abstracts are very useful. Uh, for a very fast overview, uh, is this document interesting for me or not? Uh, and normally, the technical metadata, the data uh, from your scanner, from the software, from hardware, on the, and the file properties are also stored for long-term uh, preservation. Um, and it, it was or is very used very um, uh, often that um, in Germany and Switzerland, basic metadata in the TIFF header text uh, are put in. That means the technical metadata and a very short description in, in, in one of the texts you can um, uh, um, write in um, of the uh, TIFF header. Um, here you can see a sample from the uh, from Switzerland, from the um, Retro Seals um, um, application, which is hosted at the ETH library in uh, Zurich. Um, you see here a table of content which is produced from an XML file uh, they have made uh, by um, um, uh, browsing through the pages and tagged the chapter, the subchapter, and uh, applied the um, attributes for the chap for the title and so on. Uh, and so you can have here a direct access to the um, articles of this 
uh, uh, language and literature. Yeah. It's a, a, a volume of a certain journal they store on it. it it's, it's a journal server for different um, uh, kind of sciences. Uh, uh, there are engineering journals on it. There are the uh, memory of uh, the Swiss uh, construction um, is there stored. Um, and uh, pedagogical uh, uh, journals, it's a, a large um, collection. If you are digitizing, it is useful to have a kind of production database which enable you to uh, automate um, the several steps. Then you can drive, if you are ready with scanning, it will be go to the indexing and after that maybe you will have uh, some automatic conversions. Uh, for example, OCR and um, uh, output PDFA. Um, the optically uh, process of the OCR, uh, which is normally used, is not corrected because it's much too much uh, work on it. Um, and uh, of course, you can, the OCR nowadays uh, gives you um, from normal documents, from Antiqua, uh, gives you uh, rates uh, in 98% in or something like that without correction. So you can it can be used for a fuzzy full text retrieval. Uh, and partially the OCR is able to include layout and structure analysis. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Um, and the the uh, in the picture in the image you see on this slide, uh, you can see that the we issued a um, um, full text search for bridge, and you see highlighted um, this word in the several um, uh, in the hit list uh, in the items of the hit list. And uh, this uh, is uh, caused because we um, um, remember the word position on the page, and then you are able to highlight it in uh, several applications. For example, here, in another by, uh, uh, example, um, you see there a little uh, uh, curvation line uh, under the word bridge and you will find it uh, very fast in the text. Um, metadata is a very um, deep discussed or the, the most discussed um, uh, item in long-term uh, um, preservation or archiving. Um, today, uh, there are a lot of different standards, and these standards are used for uh, different kind of documents. Every, nearly every uh, uh, metadata implementation is based today on XML schemas. I think you have heard already of METS as a container with sections and links for or to all kind of metadata. Uh, mods for content and sub substructural data, TEI for full text, and mix NISO metadata for images, um, which you can, uh, which we have here the links for where you can um, uh, have a look uh, and more information from the uh, Library of Congress in United States. Um, Normally, without using um, a format like PDFA, you see here a sample how um, our, one of our customers has organized the long-term preservation, the archival information package um, with the, uh, the relation to the physical I I item. Um, with the bibliographic metadata, which in, uh, is included in the metadata 
uh, in different XML schemes. Of course, the files are uh, within uh, the uh, result of OCR and all is gathered in METS. Um, and uh, um, it, th all these informations, um, um, these very uh, granular uh, informations um, uh, are gathered into a tariff file. Um, they build a checksum file in a secure um, uh, for um, secure that this that you can prove if this file is uh, later not altered. Um, so it is you have at, at, uh, at the end you have one unit but it is a very complicated unit and um, um, this uh, uh, it, it is a problem partially that one uh, a certain tile format is not read on all um, uh, in, uh, operating systems for example so we come come now to the uh, Thomas mentioned it already. Um, what can we put in such a PDFA file? We can put there the original image data in the highest possible digital master quality. Um, we can con uh, um, include the color management data. Of course, we have to do it. Um, we can, in the XMP schema, we can um, insert all descriptive, substructural, and administrative metadata. Um, in the XMP uh, uh, part of um, in PDFA1 or PDFA2, and in the PDFA3, you can uh, import it also in the source format as an XML or whatever you are using uh, for um, um, gather, uh, for gathering it. Um, you can have, of course, um, representation of content and structural information of the document via bookmarks. That's, that, that means you can um, convert uh, the table of content you have uh, indexed um, into bookmarks. You have a, the, the possibility to um, make a full text search with underlying uh, text, which is behind the image, and you will see it highlighted like you uh, are used to, to see it in uh, the normal PDF uh, from um, Born Digital uh, formats. Um, you, have, you, you can, if you want, uh, to secure uh, the, uh, that uh, the, um, that you know in some years this uh, file is not altered. Uh, you can secure it with a possible digital signature, which is included. And as a conclusion, we get one file and one source for the long-term archiving of a document. This is, I think, uh, the second time or a little bit in another kind of way, another way expressed, as uh, Thomas mentioned it already, uh, PDFA has to be device independent, self contained, self documenting. Uh, it must be accessible, um, it must be available. There, must, there is a specification which is publicly available, and the widespread use is the best deterrent against preservation risks. The workflow you will have if you store your precious works um, with, within PDFA is quite the same as uh, we saw before. It's a scanning, it's image enhancement, uh, you perform optical character recognition, you have to um, index uh, the structure and uh, the titles for chapter and so on, or you can um, have uh, very sophisticated um, 
version of your of an OCR which can recognize uh, titles, chapters, and so on, and the structure of a document. Um, it is possible to apply bibliographic data from your um, uh, catalog or other databases, or you have to cat capture them if, if they are not available. Um, you have to make de derived images for your web presentation if you want one. Um, all this workflow can be driven by a production repository um, by a certain status for each, each step. Um, and you can then all gather data and metadata in the described way um, put in, uh, in one file, which is very easy to handle. Um, and you are sure that you can get out uh, everything you put in, in the original format you have produced it. Now I will show some samples um, from the German National Library of Science and Techn Technology and the related basic sciences, the TIB UB in Hanover. Um, they have research reports. The collection of them uh, has uh, to be scanned partially in black and white, gray and color. Um, we captured uh, also black and white text, um, photos, figures, and so on. Uh, for example, text in one page in black and white, the photo in uh, color was then automatically uh, mixed in these pages. Uh, this, is, uh, all, uh, this is possible in PDF. You can do this. Um, and we capture the structure of the reports and um, are produced from this table of contents with direct links to chapters so that we can put in uh, bookmarks in it and um, uh, can put these informations also in the uh, library system. <coughs> of course, OCR, we performed OCR without correction. Um, yeah, output uh, uh, SPDFA. And this electronic collection, this complete collection, is now available via the TIB Get Info service. service and this is a, uh, the website uh, where you can uh, browse through and ha have a look on these uh, research reports. For the ETH library, there was a scanning of about 1.5 million uh, pages from dissertations. Uh, starting in the year 1909, uh, uh, it was the dissertation with the number one. Um, up to, I don't know, uh, I don't remember how much uh, in overall, but there have been 1.5 million pages. Um, uh, it was scanned in 600 dpi, gray in color, uh, in 300 dpi. Uh, we performed also an automated OCR without correction, and uh, it is available under the e-collection link you see in this presentation, and I think we will ha hand it to, over to you that you ha can have a look there. Um, the last thing is uh, um, the German Broadcasting Archive. Um, they, they digitized a lot of manuscripts of the Black Channel. It was a typical agitation um, broadcast from the former GDR. Um, I don't know if you understand a little bit German. The man who is uh, looking um, in this picture uh, in German, we, we, he has the name Zudel Ede for his Black Channel uh, uh, talk. <laughs> um, there was um, a digitization of uh, a program a journal up to 1989, and uh, a Polizeiruf 110 um, is a, a criminal, crimi, what, what is it? What is a it? Criminal series. Cr criminal series. 
which was produced by the um, broadcast of the, the GDR. The Sandmännchen or Sandman uh, is a very special uh, digitization. We we uh, digitized. The Sandman has a lot of vehicles. It can fly. It can roll with the with the uh, Fahrzeug. What is vehicles? A lot of different things, um, and we uh, digitized all these contracts construction plans. And uh, also a um, TV, TV guide with which name is FF Dabai. Um, Sandman is still living. It is, uh, I just look on a broadcasting station which uh, uh, send it every evening at uh, six o'clock in the evening. Um, there is another series we digitized, uh, der Staatsanwalt, 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 what is Staatsanwalt? Okay. And all these things are stored and presented in PDF A are, and are available um, via this website. So this one were uh, some um, uh, samples. And now I think Thing, uh, I thank uh, thank you very much for your patience. And now I think we should have a discussion and questions and answers. Okay. Thank you very much. It was very interesting to hear, <coughs> especially the last one, uh, because we have the same Sandman in Finnish television. Okay. I love this one. <laughs> it, it, it's called Nukkumatti, the DDR one uh, in here. But uh, we have, I have now option to ask some questions. I have a uh, uh, something that uh, because I'm, I'm personally I'm thinking that this PDF A3 could be a very good one, especially for for uh, business archives, because there's, it is very normal that you have a different kind of information, including, for example, a simple thing like uh, contract and uh, project uh, information. Typically, you have to have the Excel file where you can find out how these prices are calculated and, and so on. And if you just save a, a permanent picture of this uh, Excel file. It does not help very much without you can see the forms. Is there, uh, do you have any this kind of solutions done in Germany? Um, I, so I, I mean it, that you, you, uh, you have the Excel files included in the, in the uh, like contracts or other uh, written office documents? I think the, the applications um, where this is used uh, to put in all the original files, um, these are now emerging and uh, one of the samples uh, Thomas showed. Try to show again. Yeah. He tried to show again. You see, excellent. Um, uh, there you see a, a, a PPT, a PowerPoint presentation from a webinar and also an Excel, XLS file as a sample. Um, there, I think the, the usage uh, will be broader and broader uh, in the next years, but in, in the uh, pr practical life sample is for example, the Zuckford, the electronic invoicing would be the PDF three. So this is, yeah, so, so the, the electronic invoicing is, is really the use case number one, which is now heavily used in Germany. But as I said, they are also talking with the European Union because it comes from Brussels that every EU country must go for electronic invoices in the next years. Then. From my point of view, the application area number two is email, the one we are looking here at. And then we have a colleague who just did it, and 
they do it as yeah, in an ECM system. So in the whole context, it was a special one in Germany, develop is the name, <laughs> and there they're using now heavily PDFA3 for, yeah, they call it digital folders. So this is, a, let's say, a sequence of, of use cases. There are, as Achim said, more to come. Just a moment. Onko muilla kysymyksiä? Uh, and then I have another one, which is uh, because we don't have very much experience at the moment, uh, how to uh, make the verification of the PDF A3. Uh, uh, but uh, the problem I can see in there is that uh, when you have contents which are not permanently uh, or, or which are not archival in archival format, we still need to uh, verify the contents that they are stable. Is there, is there a problem putting a, a, a video file or something inside the PDF A3 package? And after five years, you have to check that if the video file is still complete and, and working. Uh, is there any kind of uh, plans to build these kind of tools which can verify also the information inside the PDF A3 package? Well, one possibility could be, of course you cannot guarantee that the um, video file uh, is uh, valid after five years. One possibility you can can do is that you make um, um, a hash uh, checksum for the file and store it also into the PDF A3 because the normal PDF A validation, of course, cannot um, assure that the um, other file formats which are included, uh, where PDF A3 is used as a container only, um, if you perform the PDF validation, uh, you will um, prove also only the, the PDF A part, which is the rendition of the, for example, the Excel file or for the, the, the but you cannot have a rendition for the video. So maybe you have to include more characteristics uh, where you can then um, validate this has not altered all the time. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, I, I know that it's complicated and a bit, it's a little bit early because we don't have these files. <laughs> I've had those files so, so long, but anyway, any other questions? If not, then we are uh, saying thank you very much for your, for your uh, presentation and uh, maybe you can hear our big hands. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Osmo. And, uh, yeah, have a, have a good conference. I think you still have another day to go tomorrow. Thank you very much. We'll see a, a couple of, sooner or later in some conference. Thank you. Okay, we stay in contact. Thank you. Bye bye. <coughs>